Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Carrington, and you're listening to Call Talk for August 16th, 2017. Today's topic is building a customer-focused culture in your contact center. And, of course, if you're listening live, we invite you to be a part of the show and ask questions. The best way to do it is just to email me at brian at benchmarkportal.com, and I'll get them in. That is spelled out B-R-I-A-N at benchmarkportal.com. So I want to remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to listen to at any time that's good for you. You can find them on our website, benchmarkportal.com. Look for Call Talk, and you'll see a huge archive of almost eight seasons of the show. So enjoy. Find something that's relevant to you, and enjoy a nice listen. So let's jump right into the show today. It's my pleasure to introduce the host of Call Talk, Mr. Bruce Belfiore. Thank you, Brian, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. Well, people in our sector are all talking about the customer experience these days. Uh, We in the contact center sector have moved from a culture based on pure efficiency and the metrics of service, things like average talk time, average speed of answer, service levels, etc., to a more balanced culture that looks also at the content and the quality of the customer experience. There's no better way to foster consistently superior customer experiences in your center than to build a customer-focused culture there. And that's why we've invited Jeff Toyster, author of the Service Culture Handbook, to talk to us about how to build those customer-focused cultures from the ground up. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks, Bruce. I appreciate you having me here. It's going to be fun. Yes, we're going to have a good time, and we're delighted to have you with us, Jeff. And by the way of introduction to our listeners, in addition to the Service Culture Handbook, Jeff has also authored customer service training videos, including customer service fundamentals and phone-based customer service. He was named one of the world's top 30 customer service professionals by Global Gurus and is listed as one of the top 50 thought leaders to follow on Twitter by the International Customer Management Institute. Feedspot calls his inside customer service blog one of the top 50 customer service blogs as well. So we're looking forward to getting a lot of high-powered insights from you on this topic today, Jeff. All set? All set. Okay, great. Well, let's start with the the basics, Jeff. Uh, What does a customer-focused culture look like in a contact center environment? The first word that comes to mind to me is obsession. In other words, agents are obsessed with serving their customers. They're not necessarily obsessed, you know, as you said, with the metrics of efficiency, which is kind of yesterday's news. They're obsessed with serving their customers. And I see three characteristics. One, everybody has a common goal. Uh, Two, everybody's committed to achieving it. And and three, agents feel their position to succeed. And, And I'll give you a quick example. Uh, if, if, if you or any of your listeners have ever worked in a contact center before, you've probably experienced a scenario where the phone system goes down and suddenly you can't talk to customers. And in most mm-hmm. contact centers, it's kind of this, this awkward moment where we're looking at each other going, what do we do? And we just try to ride it out. Well, at Rackspace, which is a, a company that provides uh, cloud-based computer hosting uh, services, they're so committed and so obsessed with serving their customers that when their phone system went down, They spent about a few seconds looking at each other, and then one agent took the initiative to tweet his personal phone number and said, hey, our phone system's down, but you can call me here. Another agent said, that's a great idea. I'm going to do the same thing. Several other agents followed suit, and for about four hours, they served their customers via their personal phones. Now, what's amazing to me about this is that nobody told them to do it. It wasn't part of a training program. They didn't even ask permission. They just did it, and, and it's hard to believe that you know most contact centers would see agents being that obsessed. So that, to me, would be an example of a customer-focused culture. That is that is a great story, very very uh, telling and very uh, important. I mean, I, I think that uh, that oftentimes comes from showing the obsession from the higher ups, and then having it actually executed at the front line level. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, in terms of what I've seen, too, is if you talk about culture from day one, in other words, from the time they walk in uh, for their first day of training, 
then it will really start to take root. Uh, and telling stories, the kind of stories, Jeff, that you just told, uh, can really help out with that as well because it illustrates what it means. In other words, culture seems like a dry thing until actually you put some flesh and bones on it and come up with a, a story like the one you just talked about. Um, and then even sometimes awarding people, uh, recognizing people for the things that they do can be very important. Uh, so, yeah, those are, those are great, great insights there. Well, what's the most important thing that contact center leaders can do to get their agents to be customer focused? So, Bruce, I'm glad you said leaders because I think often leaders, they, they don't intentionally do this, but they kind of expect their employees to take the, the lead. Uh, in other words, they'll send their agents to some sort of training, for example, or they'll, they'll send an email or a memo and say, let's be customer focused. And that's the mm -hmm. extent of it. But as you said, leaders need to lead. And, and so I think the fir very first thing a leader needs to do is help establish a, what I call a customer service vision. And this is a shared definition of outstanding service. It's a collective definition that, that everybody understands. And, uh, you know, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. You know, at Rackspace, they have what they call their fanatical support promise, and it, it doesn't promise that nothing will ever go wrong but it does say we will rise to the occasion if something does go wrong, which, you know, tweeting your personal phone numbers is definitely rising to the occasion. Uh, I'll For give sure. you a completely different organization, the, uh, the uh, Center for uh, Clean, uh, Sustainable Energy. They have in California where, where I'm based, Bruce, I know you're based as well, a clean mm -hmm. vehicle rebate programs. So if you buy a Prius or or another type of vehicle where the state offers you a rebate for going green, so to speak, this is the group that actually helps their custom, customers process those rebates. And they created a vision that says, we help you join the green vehicle movement. In other words, we want to make it easy for you to do that. Now, the entire team created that vision, but it's up to the leader to reinforce that vision on a daily basis, to hire and train based upon that vision, and to empower agents to actually help their customers fulfill that vision. So I, I think you said it well, it all comes back to leaders and, and creating mm -hmm. that clear vision for everyone to follow. Yeah, I think that's, that's really important. And, um, uh, you know, basically talking but also walking the talk and showing people how you yourself as a call center leader are doing everything you can to foster that kind of culture is just so, so important. And uh, recognizing other people when they do it, you know, sort of holding them up as, as good examples. Well, uh, you know, your book, Jeff, spends a lot of time on employee engagement. And uh, I'd like to hear your thought about the links between customer focus, and engaging your agents? Yeah, because I, I was given, I won't name the company, but as you know, there's a lot of companies out there that do all this employee engagement research. And I was giving them a hard time. Um, we were one of the rest of a hard time the other day, a natured hard time. But my point to them and my point to many of these engagement companies is we don't have a consistent definition of engagement. So to understand the link between customer focus and engagement, we need to first define what engagement is. And I found the definition varies depending on who you ask. My preferred definition is two parts. One is an engaged agent understands what makes the contact center, or better yet, the organization successful. And two, they're committed to helping achieve that. So when you break it down that way, um, the link between customer focus then is an engaged agent understands what customer focus looks like and, and how the organization or the contact center defines outstanding service, but they also feel that they're committed to achieving that. And, and I think the, the commitment part, it's really interesting where that comes from. You know, there's a, there's a study that, that you actually put out that I think is fantastic. Um, it was, I think it's 2013, the Agent Voices survey, was that um, when that yes. last came out? Okay. That's correct. And, and, and there it's was, about to be updated. That's correct. Yep. Oh, mm -hmm. I can't wait to see it. Uh, and, and here's why. There was a, a set of data in there that, that you produced that showed it was 
agent satisfaction by how long they've been in the contact center. Now, satisfaction and engagement are different things, but satisfaction is certainly a – job satisfaction is a driver of, en, of engagement. So we can still look at that as a signal. And one of the things that, that really struck me when I looked at that report was that sat, agent satisfaction takes a nosedive after about three months. Guess what happens in the typical contact center after three months? The st- typical contact center spends about 12 weeks or three months training and nesting their agents. So satisfaction dies once the agent starts working on the real job. And, and what that tells me is that the contact centers aren't doing a good enough job empowering agents to fulfill that vision and take care of their customers. And, and, and I, I think that's the real opportunity. If we want engaged agents who are customer-focused, we need to make it easy for them to be customer-focused and fulfill our, our shared definition of outstanding service, that, that vision. Mm. No, I think that is key, very, very important uh, insight. And uh, empowering agents, obviously, is not just one thing. What you have to do is put them in a situation where they know what they're supposed to do, they believe in it, and then they have the tools to be able to execute on it. So, uh, you know, the, in terms of the knowing what they're supposed to do, that comes from the training. Uh, in terms of, you know, wanting to do it because they are engaged with it, part of that has to do with values, too. So when you're trying to communicate these things that we've been talking about through the culture, uh, part of it's, you know, keeping in mind that you have to give them a sense of purpose as well, particularly the millennial generation. It's not just what do you have to do, but why it's important to do it and important to do it really well. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on that also, Jeff. Um, And, you know, to engage their values, right, as well as their intellect and um, and their their engagement in terms of just uh, the the mechanics of what they do. Uh, What thoughts do you have on that, Jeff? Well, I, I think you're absolutely right, it, and it's not, you know, we kind of talk about millennials, but it's not just a millennial thing. We all want to go to work with a purpose, and that's where that customer service vision comes in, that shared definition of outstanding service that says this is our purpose when we go to work each and every day. And, and you said something else, Bruce, I think is really important. You know, a lot of people think of empowerment as authority. In other words, I empower you by giving you authority to, uh, let's say spend that extra two minutes on a call to serve a customer. Fantastic. It, it, empowerment does include authority, but you mentioned tools, and, and mm-hmm. I think that's critical. In other words, I, can, I had an issue. I won't name the company, but uh, I was trying to buy some furniture. And online, it, it said this furniture will be delivered in four weeks. And when I actually put my order in and processed it, it suddenly said, well, it's going to be five and a half months. So Mm -hmm. I talked to a customer service agent and, and they were empowered in terms of the authority to provide information and spend extra time, et cetera. But what they didn't have was the right tool to understand why did it jump from four weeks to five months? And was that time accurate? And was there anything else they can do instead? They didn't have the resources because the company had two different inventory management systems that weren't talking to each other. So you're, you're so right. It's, it's the purpose and believing in that. But uh, that quickly erodes if each and every day you're taking call after call after call where it's, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Unfortunately, we're unable to because of the system. I mean, no one wants to work in that kind of environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, systems are so important in, in this. They are part of what uh, brings things together. And I think that managers need to develop the arguments and the, um, you know, approaches that will allow them to better talk to their superiors about what they need so that they can give their agents the tools that they have to have to give really good customer service. And uh, knowledge management systems are oftentimes, you know, problems for for call centers. You see that all the time, I'm sure, Jeff, the the situations that you were just talking about. Uh, Customer relationship management systems that um, disappoint in many ways. Uh, Those poor people who have to labor with, you know, a dozen legacy systems 
ta- uh, desktop systems yeah. and maybe do cut, cuts and pastes in order to sort of take this information and put it over here, and sometimes they forget, and so there's holes in it, et cetera. Yeah. And, you know, if they if – they, uh, there was a uh, an investment made in some middleware. You know, you don't necessarily have to do a whole rip and replace. Even maybe you just get some middleware in there that uh, brings these things together. And yes, it's an investment, but you can figure out the return on that investment. And the return will be both in terms of uh, less time that the agent has to spend doing things that the agent doesn't want to do either because it's very boring. Um, as, as well as the fact that they will simply be able to serve their customers better, more quickly, and, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a more high-quality way. Absolutely. But I, I think that return that, that you talked about, quite frankly, I think contact center leaders need to get better at that. Uh, when, mm-hmm. when I see contact center leaders That's talking happy. about improvement, I see them talking about programs or initiatives. Mm-hmm. I don't see them articulating the business case. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I was working with a contact center leader who was really wanting to improve the customer experience. And, and he showed me this long email that he sent to his company president to articulating this program in great detail. And I said, that's great, but, but realize that your company president is going to read that email and the message is, hey, can we spend more money, please? There's mm-hmm there really needs to be that cost benefit analysis. And, and as we dug into that, he showed me another email from his president that said, Hey folks, we've got a big problem with customer churn. In other words, we're losing more customers than we should. And that was the opportunity. Uh, and, and what I suggested was go find out what aspects are causing that churn and what aspects your contact center can contribute to and hopefully improve upon. And that's your business case. That's what your executive leader wants to hear is here's a problem that you've identified and, and here are some numbers that back it up that says we've got a solution. And I think that's a real opportunity for contact center leaders to get better at speaking the language of their executives. Mm, okay. No, I uh, second that very, very loudly because it, it's really what you, uh, our listeners as contact center leaders can do to get buy-in from executive leadership. Uh, and it's so much of it's, yes, having a clear view of what it is that needs to be done, having a clear way of being able to articulate it on an operating level. But then when you're able to also translate it, as you said, Jeff, uh, into economic terms, that you're showing respect, too, for the things that they're sweating about in their corner offices every day. Because, remember, they have to uh, come through with the financial performance, with the earnings per share, all of that sort of thing. And if they see you as just a cost center, which is out there, um, you know, draining money, that's one thing. On the other hand, if they see you as an opportunity for uh, return on investment, for extra earnings per share, uh, then all of a sudden they look at you in a totally different light. And that's what we want. We want you to, uh, to be able to communicate to them in their language, as you said, Jeff, because everybody's got their three-letter acronyms, right? And for those guys, <laughs> right. for those people, right, uh, women and men in, in the corner offices, they're sweating about uh, return on investment and particularly earnings per share. What are they going to be yep. reporting? Yep. And if we can actually uh, show either something that is going to reduce costs in a way that is going to add to their earnings per share, then all of a sudden you, you earn yourself a, a place at the table in terms of senior management thinking. And I think that's really, really important. You know, it's funny you mentioned uh, a return on investment. I, I, I wish I was making this up, but I've, I've seen so many contact center leaders refer to a return on investment as it got better or our customer satisfaction went up five percentage points. And I think the danger there is, you know, return on investment is a pretty hard number financial metric. And if you're going to talk to your executives, make sure you know what you're talking about. <laughs> make sure you mm-hmm. look up the formula for ROI. Don't don't tell your senior leaders that your the ROI was it got better. That's not going to help your credibility. Right. Right. No, absolutely. Because they're, they're very, I mean, people are critical with them. And so they're going to be very critical with you. And, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of, 
a lot of for a lot of call center people who are by nature people people right uh right brained and all that kind of stuff the worst day of the year is going into that um meeting for budgeting right because it's like going on to a different planet these people are motivated by different things they're a bunch of bean counters and uh they just don't understand us well, in fact, they can't understand you if you just speak their language and put things in their terms. And what we found, and I'm sure you have as well, is that it's not unusual for the contact center to be the locus of some of the best investments that can be made in the whole organization. And the reason for that is because nobody's been investing there, and they haven't understood how to do the uh, the analyses that are necessary. But uh, investments in core business of organizations oftentimes, you know, could be uh, in some older industries too, uh, 15, 20 percent or something. Uh, it's not unusual for the low-hanging fruit that we find in co contact centers to go over 100 percent in the first year. So uh, it's there. Uh, you just need to, you know, get the information you need and the, the tools and the um, you know, formulas that you need, as you said, to be able to do that. Well, that, that, these are great insights, and uh, Brian is letting me know that he has some questions here from the audience. So is there anything else that you wanted to add to that, uh, Jeff, before we move on to the questions? Yeah, I always like involving people. So if we've got some questions from the audience, um, um, let's go. I'd, I'd like to hear what, what they want to know. Okay, great. Brian, over to you. Perfect. Oh, great. Uh, actually, I've uh, kind of organized the questions, and the first one is uh, kind of a, uh, an extension of what you guys are just talking about, buy-in. Um, but before we get into that, I did want to mention that, uh, Jeff, you must be popular. Uh, I'm getting some emails from some of my contacts, and they said, unfortunately, we can't make the show, but they're looking forward to listening to it later on the archive. So I want to give a, a shout-out to the folks at Lucky Vitamin. So enjoy the show. Hope you get a lot out of it. Okay, so mm. this one comes from Cody. Well, we do our best to create a customer-focused culture in our center. However, we need to coordinate and hand off situations to other parts of our company where the culture is different. How can I get managers of these other departments to buy in to what we're doing? You know, I would start, Cody, by, by taking the opposite view and asking yourself, what, how do these other departments view your contact center? Uh, in, in other words, if you... Just try to get them to buy into what you're doing. Uh, you might miss what they're trying to do. So I would start by maybe trying to meet them in the middle. In, in the best organizations, the contact center is an extension of the organizational culture, and each other department is the same way. So you know, one of the things you might you might do is is have that initial meeting and say, you know, we really want to know what makes you successful and how we can add value as the contact center. And once you have that dialogue, you're, you're going to find there's much more openness for them to say, hey, you're helping us succeed. How can we help you succeed? And that's often when you find, you know, you have a lot in common and there's an opportunity for partnership. So my oh. advice, uh, just like you were serving an external customer, uh, internal customer, find out how you can help them, and that opens the door for them to be a little bit more on board with what you're doing. Mm. Great answer. Great answer there, uh, Jeff. And, you know, I, I think in terms of the fact that uh, these days people are trying desperately in companies to tear down the old silos uh, because the silos are the normal state for most organizations, but they prevent quick change and therefore prevent, uh, you know, quick adapt adaptation to market needs and to customer needs. And uh, by doing what you're talking about, which uh, I refer to as building a, a radial organization, uh, reaching out to your colleagues and figuring out what is making them tick and what's making them sweat and what makes them exult, uh, and um, you know, understanding their goals for the year, et cetera, all those things are so important. Build the radial organization and uh, cut down the silos and make the bringing down of the silos as non-threatening as possible. It's not always easy, in fact, because people are very comfortable inside those silos. But if you can tell them that, you know, you're actually kind of a, a good person to work with, uh, you can be kind of fun, and uh, you guys can do some cool stuff together, 
if you can bring that across, then you'll uh, be well on your way to building that radial organization that can can help out with uh, the issues that you're talking about, Cody. So, yeah, very good. Brian, do we have another question? Yeah, I've got two more. Yeah. So uh, this one comes from Celine. And, uh, you know, here we go. Big topic, not only in the contact center industry, but uh, pretty much any industry out there is we all have generations in our center, which sometimes can cause friction. I'd like to try to overcome these issues by focusing everyone on a culture that all can buy into. So uh, any suggestions there, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think the key, Celine, is, is everyone, right? Everyone to buy into. Um, I'm, I'm going to risk a little controversy here, and I think the whole generation thing is a little overblown. And you'll find, if you look carefully, uh, your employees have a lot more in common, but sometimes there's a difference in experience level and the experiences that people have had. They bring different things to the table. So when I work with my clients to create a customer service vision, which is the cornerstone of a customer-focused culture, the very first thing I do is I get input from everybody. And usually I do this with a, a one-question survey where I ask, when our customers think of the service we provide, what do you want them to think of? And then I take that input and I put it all together, and then I gather just seven to ten people. That's a cross-section, so these different generations, but representing front lines, different tiered levels, leadership as well, and we actually write the vision. And, and the reason I only have seven to ten people is I found through trial and error that is the appropriate number of people. Too many more, more than that, and you're going to get too many voices in the room. It's hard to wordsmith. Too few, you don't get enough voices. So the seven to ten people should represent these different levels of experience. And what I found is in about two hours, you can usually come up with a fantastic customer service vision that really resonates with everybody in your contact center. But, but notice the whole process is about involving everybody and giving everybody a voice so that everybody, regardless of role or experience, feels like they have an ownership stake in that culture. Yeah. No, oh, that's so, so important. And, Selena, as I was thinking about what you said or what you asked here, one of the things you mentioned is it causes friction. And uh, I would agree with Jeff that in many cases the generational differences are overblown by the analysts. Uh, they're fun things to write about. And now I've just seen something come through, Jeff, on Generation Z. So one of my colleagues is saying, oh, my God, we haven't even figured out how to deal with Gen X yet and uh, the, the millennials, and now they're throwing another one at us. You know, these are people who've right. uh, <laughs> born, been born even later. Um, so, you know, but I th think that sort of thing is, is fun to look at, can sometimes be overblown. But try to analyze, Celine, in your situation, are we really talking about generational differences or are they clicks based on age? Because sometimes they uh, won't be actually uh, meeting the same definitions that the pundits are putting in those articles that you're reading about. And in fact, you may look at them and say, well, you know, these people are definitely – a, a grouping inside, and they're they're uh, the same age levels, sort of thing, but uh, they're not sort of meeting the definition. Well, it, it could be that it's it's something more common than that, and uh, but you still have to deal with it. They're basically social silos that are based on sort of cliques and and uh, personal affinities, and and there you know you need to take that into account, and you need to deal with it. Um, in a way that causes those clicks to melt and to melt into the common culture that you're trying to get using, I think, the um, techniques that, that Jeff was talking about. And um, so th that would be my, you know, thoughts on that as well. And Celine, best, uh, best wishes on that because I think it is important that you – uh, melt those social silos and get people to all be focused on that that culture of uh, great service to your customers. Okay, back over to uh, to Brian. I think we've got time for another question, don't we? Yep, looks like we've got just a couple minutes left. Um, and so uh, this one comes from Stephen. Uh, another hot topic out there. We're uh, going to pilot an at-home agent program starting next month. And as a manager, what should I be concerned about on the culture side? 
Well, I'm glad you're doing a pilot versus jumping full bore because you're going to learn a lot from that pilot, Stephen. Uh, let me share with you some things that I've seen some really customer-focused companies do uh, to build that culture. Uh, one oh. <laughs> is they, they have touch points. So, for example, uh, JetBlue, uh, which is a very strong customer-focused culture, they have their agents come in uh, at least quarterly. And, and so it helps avoid that sense of isolation. We do a little team building, et cetera. Uh, I've seen uh, Starbucks with their internal contact center. Uh, so this is they're supporting different stores. One of the things they do is uh, they have some of their more experienced agents create um, like uh, do tastings where they lead the team through tastings, even though they might be remote and doing this. So you're, you're finding ways to feature people who are working remote kind of leading an activity. And, and then something I see contact centers generally doing is just having video-based check-in meetings, one-on-one -on -one perhaps with a, a supervisor or with teammates, having internal communication systems where everybody's sharing ideas. So I think you can draw from, from a few examples, but the overall theme should be understand that working on home at home can be a little isolating at times. And if you can find ways to draw those people back into the daily environment and interactions that we have with our co colleagues in the office, I think you'll, you'll avoid some of that erosion of your culture. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with everything Jeff said, uh, that uh, the at-home agent programs are not just a matter of pushing out technology and training. Uh, it is a matter also of pushing out the mission of the company and the culture and making people feel a part of that, you know, sort of drawing them into it even though they're, they're based uh, outside the company. And it can be done. And, uh, you know, by doing a pilot on it, you'll learn the best ways to do it in your environment. So, uh, Stephen, good luck to you. I think that's uh, something that will add flexibility undoubtedly to your scheduling. And that in and of itself could be something that um, helps out in terms of morale and helps out in terms of uh, the culture. So, great. Well, these have been uh, fabulous. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time period here. Jeff, uh, I wish we had another hour or two to talk, but um, are there any final thoughts that you have before we turn things back over to Brian? But it, it did kind of fly by. Um, I, I think the only thing I, I would share with, with your listeners is that building a customer-focused culture is a never-ending journey. It's not a quick fix. It's something that we need to focus on continuously over a long period of time. And when you understand that, you'll understand what these elite contact centers have been able to do differently, I think, than, than the, the average group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Uh, great thoughts there. And, uh, Brian, I'll turn it over to you to, to wrap things up, and thank you very much to our audience. Sounds good, guys. Well, uh, thanks, of course, to our uh, guest today, Jeff Toyster, as well as our host, Bruce Belfiore. Another show here of Call Talk is in the books. And, of course, you can join us anytime that's good for you in our archive, where we have over seven seasons of the show on our website, BenchmarkPortal.com. So uh, go ahead and head there, find a topic that works for you, and enjoy. So from all of us here at Benchmark Portal, keep those headsets steady and, of course, your fingers ready. This is Brian Carrington signing out. Have a great day. Take care.